Hi Angela, welcome to the podcast. Hi Vivian, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. You're welcome. I'm excited to dive into the more complex subjects of fertility because I've had Rosie on in the past and I'll link that episode in the show notes. We spoke about the kind of basics of fertility, hormonal balance. So this one is for the people who are already eating a healthy diet, they're living a healthy lifestyle, avoiding the toxins, all of these things. So I wanted to get you on as the fertility expert to talk about some more complex subjects, but hopefully you can break it down into more simple, simple terms. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great you've had Rosie on. Love Rosie. She's got you know so much to say about fertility. So it's great you've covered all the basics. Exactly. I agree with that one. It was a good episode. Um, so I wanted to ask you how you got into the world of fertility and what made you want to specialise in fertility in particular? Um, well, I guess I've always been one of those really uh, sad women that's really been fascinated by hormones from the moment I got my period. So I always had that kind of interest. Um, I never had any major problems to begin with, with my periods or them going missing or you know, problems with pain or anything like that. So I guess from that perspective, it was quite easy for me to study it and get interested in it. Um, but as I got older, I started to, you know, get some problems with um, migraines and I got in, interested in, in why that was happening. I went to conventional medicine, you know, down the doctor's route and secondary care and passed off to endocrinologists and all sorts, but they didn't really seem to be able to help me much. So I kind of got into it from that side and finding out I had a really high level of prolactin actually started me down that rabbit hole. So I always generally tend to suffer more from that. And when my stress levels get pretty high, also my prolactin starts to get higher as well. So that's something that, um, you know, is, is a, a fascinating subject for me. Why as females were actually, you know, able to do this, what happens at each of the phases, what hormones are important in the follicular phase, what are important in the luteal phase, just fascinated it with the whole subject really Vivian and I think you know we we all should be as women you know the amazing things we can do and we're told you know that periods are, are awful they're a curse you know we're told to take a contraceptive pill that effectively makes us more like men you know we're not small men we actually need to understand our bodies a lot more and I'm absolutely fascinated by it and and really keen to help educate women and that's what I do as part of my consultations with them as well. Yeah, I think I'm one of those geeks as well who <laughs> obsessed with hormones. <laughs> I'm there with you, don't worry. <laughs> do you think that infertility is on the rise? And if yes, why do you think that is? I know there's a number of factors. What do you think are the big factors in that? Yeah, and I think this is why I'm getting busier, really, Vivian. It's a bit of a catch-22 situation. You know, I'm getting more people coming to me now in the last two years than I probably have done in my whole career of 11 years, really. So I think what's happening is we're living in a much more complicated world now. Um, there's, you know, a range of things as to why people's fertility are actually going down. And I guess we'll probably be talking about some of those things. But I think, you know, genetics definitely plays a big part into that. You know, and if we've had um, something that's caused famine or disease in the past, if we're in a period now of time where which our bodies you know in as a human history have never actually experienced where we've had all sorts of food that we can eat at any time um you know i know our bodies are getting into the stage where you know we're having obesity and loads of different kind of conditions that relate to that there's also you know all sorts of things happening from the fact that the world has become a lot more polluted and we're not cooking food the way we used to like our ancestors were and we're not listening to some of that you know, valuable um, knowledge and insight, really, that our great grandmothers were and our grandparents um, were eating a much more kind of um, modern diet, which actually, although we have more choice, we're choosing the wrong things, really, and we're going down that route. Um, and we're not listening to Mother Nature in terms of things that are in season and things that are important for the bodies in terms of our nutrients. So although we've kind of evolved as human beings in terms of, you know, what's happening to us and how we've got access to better food and healthcare we're actually now probably in a state much more health unhealthier than even our parents are and our mortality rates are actually lower than them because what we're doing is with more choice we're choosing more healthier options really which again is impacting our fertility um you know all the things that we're having the um the environments we're living in as well are making a major impact on our delicate um 
brain to ovary connection and brain to testy connection and I think these things are, are very important and once the body is in, in an unbalanced state fertility is one of the first things to actually um, leave the party effectively so um, we need to be in a balanced state for our body to actually produce healthy eggs and, and sperm and also healthy babies. Yeah that's definitely true fertility is not a priority your body's going to focus on the cellular health your brain function your digestion before it, it cares about your fertility and um, that's kind of sad to think but it's absolutely true and something to be aware of and I do want to get into the more um, complexities of genetics a bit later on but first I want you to kind of give an overview of some of the relatively basic things that people aren't maybe doing so couples what what common things are they overlooking when it comes to the fertility that you see um one of the major things that i'm aware of as as an educator really around um supporting couples in this whole space is they're totally unaware of their bodies um you know and what they're doing particularly females obviously because their body when it it gets that cycle stage where it's you know the follicular phase ovulation and luteal they're absolutely clueless when it comes to that so i think one of them the basics that i do really is is getting them to understand their body and looking at fertility awareness methods really so looking at things like how heavy your periods are as an indication of your health um you know what's happening with the pain levels in there if it's pain and inflammation then that's going to be you know something that the body listens to and, and may actually um, you know be be a difficult thing for it to deal with um, and also things like um, you know the length of your period as well um, things also like the length of the cycle as well how long is it between each period so getting people to understand the basics of their own cycle as a female is very very important and also the signs of fertility like um, cervical fluid as well you know I don't know about you but as, as a woman we're not told anything about this you know we we kind of sit around the classroom when we're actually having that um cervical fluid i i remember thinking god what's all this jelly like stuff in my pack <laughs> yeah. you know? and you you literally think there's something wrong with you you call it discharge i mean i absolutely hate that word when people come to me and say i've got loads of discharge and i just say well it's not a sewage font you know it's the most amazing thing the body can actually do and produce and it's a sign and and it's communicating with you as a female so it's listening to those signs understanding your cycle a bit more and and just using that as knowledge and support to help you to um sort of time sex and you know do that at the right time and doing things like um you know taking your basal body temperature and you know building up a picture of your cycle and um, so that you can actually find out when you're most fertile um, looking at things like your cervical position as well you know there's so much information that the human body actually tells you in terms of these things um, and for many you know many generations um, we used to pass that information on and I think in this this generation and probably the one before us we have really started to kind of ignore those signs and go on things like you know the oral contraceptive pill or the patch and effectively that just kind of masculinizes women it just kind of makes them you know on the level we've got one hormone and it just kind of keeps going there um so it's really important to know also about you know certain times in your month when you're more productive based on some of the hormones as well so all of this information we've got and we can glean but sadly i think we don't really understand that um, and likewise for men as well you know men um their testicles were you know designed to be outside of their body i think you know there's a lot of things they're doing now that are actually changing the way that their fertility um is presenting like for instance the men in lycra you know going to the gym wearing lycra shorts and you know pants on top of underneath their pants and then doing lots of things like you 20 know, layers absolutely <laughs> too many layers guys you know and that's not good for you because we can't um then get the right temperature or, um, you know making sperm and that can actually mutate the sperm cause problems with morphology and also count as well so there's all of these basic things really that people are, are, are getting wrong um, and in a way for me it's, it's low-hanging fruit when I can actually sort of speak to them about this and tell them more about it um, so understanding your fertility is one thing um, and also looking at eating the right way because food is so personal and we use it 
as a crutch in, in so many ways. Um, you know, we self-medicate with it as well. So it's about breaking down the habits that people have and helping them to make some new, more healthier ones, really, which will then support that. Um, you know, things like looking at the environment around them. Um, the home is an incredibly toxic place. Um, if you're sort of cleaning with all sorts of nasty chemicals, if you're, you know, putting all sorts of things on your body and um, also, you know, the air quality inside your home as well can be pretty toxic. So, you know, part of what I do is, is helping people to understand how the environment can have a huge bearing factor on your fertility. Um, just tweaking you over that level if you're already kind of, um, you know, sitting on that, that fence in terms of your fertility. Um, it can actually negate it and make it worse looking at you know diet um and also looking at fertility awareness and timing sex at the wrong time so some of these things are really basic but um we're not taught this at school we're not taught it as you know from our parents or our grandparents anymore and these are things that would have been you know part of that red tent if you like as females and also as men um telling them about fertility and they didn't necessarily as men need to have these conversations back in the day but we are now because I think male fertility is in crisis with the fact that the sperm levels have gone down 1.3 percent every single year since 1973 and I don't know why it's taken them 45 46 years to actually get to this level to make that note but you know it's it's the canary in the coal mine really it's something that we all need to be aware of and and start to work towards because it's not just the females anymore now it's it's also the men that are actually you know compounding that problem i agree definitely and i think by the time this episode has, has aired i've had um, lisa hendricks and jack on from the fertility friday podcast and oh, she spoke all about uh, fertility awareness methods so please go and listen to that anyone who's listening who's not aware of what we're talking about because there is that common misconception that we ovulate mid-cycle. If we've got a 28-day cycle, it's going to be day 14. And that's absolutely not the case. And that can cause a lot of issues with the timing of sex, like you mentioned. Um, people are just getting that totally wrong and potentially mm -hmm. missing out on their fertile window every single month without that education. Because you're right, we're not taught about all of this. We're taught that we can get pregnant any day of the month or periods are something to be ashamed about or embarrassed about to hide and cover things up and I've even had clients who think that they've got like a yeast infection or thrush because of the the cervical mucus that they're having because they've never been taught actually what it is and if they've been on the pill for a long period of time and come off they've never actually experienced that until like the 30s which is scary yeah it is isn't it you know learning about your body and the amazing things it can do at 32 as opposed to 16, 17, you know, it's, it's been working for 17 years before <laughs> that, you know, and, and we're just literally getting to the point where we're going, oh, we want to make babies now. Let's learn a little bit more about us. Um, and actually, it's, it's something that should be on regular curriculum education. You know, it's my view. And some of the stuff I did in the past before I was a nutritionist was around sexual health. Um, so I would love it if this information got into schools and, you know, we were giving, giving people the right information at that point, because that would be so much more empowering than us kind of giving this information to ladies of, you know, 35 and sometimes up to 45, you know, in, in some cases when I speak to ladies and they've actually been cycling for all that time and had no clue about what was going on and how to actually use this amazing gift that we have as, as females. I really hope it's going to change. I think slowly it's going in that direction and the help of social media. I think it's really good how more young girls are following accounts that teach them about their body and let them know maybe some of the negative effects of the birth control pill. Obviously, we, some people need to be on that and that works best for them and that's totally fine. But there are things that you can do to maybe offset some of the negative effects and understand how it's affecting your body as well. So we've covered now like the basics of fertility and again there's the diet aspect that we speak more about with Rosie but I want to get into the, some of the more complex topics and the first one being thyroid health. So we know that thyroid is important for every single cell in the body. How does thyroid affect fertility and why do people develop thyroid issues? Well, the thyroid is, is a key part of the endocrine system. And I think this is what's been missed um, with a lot of visits to the GP, really, in terms of testing. And this is why 
it's a really key part of my um, overall testing um, package that I have with people initially. Um, and I can just give you an example of that with my sister yesterday. She's been feeling a bit tired lately and, you know, not sleeping so well. And she went to the doctors in the UK and I looked at her sheet before she went. And the only thing she had on it was thyroid stimulating hormone. So they're not even giving you T4 anymore. So <laughs> when you have a, an overall test for your thyroid, what they're looking for, if you have some symptoms of thyroid problems, is whether actually the thyroid is working effectively and passing um, those hormones from the active, uh, the, the active form to the stored form. And that's what happens in between you know, T3 and T4, because um, you, you don't need a huge amount of active in the bloodstream really to help you and support your fertility. It's very important for fertility, thyroid health, because I, I always say that the thyroid is kind of like the boiler system of the body. It keeps everything going, it helps with your metabolism, and also it helps support you in pregnancy. Because when you're pregnant, your body is in a completely different state, and it's about kind of maintaining and managing that. And you can have some issues before getting pregnant with the thyroid not performing as well as it should do in terms of active and then storing what it has if it's got excess. You can also have some issues with, um, you know, it getting so bad, the thyroid, that it becomes um, an, an auto con autoimmune condition. Um, but what we need to kind of uh, consider there is making sure that everything is right. It's a bit like the hormones in the female body are a bit like a, you know, a Beethoven symphony, really. Everything's got to be just right or, you know, things actually don't work in balance. Um, and we just need to tweak those really here and there. And if there's a problem with that, it could be that particularly um, the cofactors for the thyroid aren't necessarily as good as they should be. And when I say cofactors, I mean things like nutrients. So, you know, things like iron, selenium, zinc, riboflavin and um, iodine need to be in the right um, balance really there. And if you haven't got enough of some of those, that can send the signal to the thyroid that actually... Um, it needs to go low um, because there isn't enough there and it needs to kind of almost be auxiliary mode or if um, there's not enough it can actually make the conversion between your T3 and T4 um, a bit more kind of problematic um, and again when there's not enough um, active form of um, uh, thyroid hormone in the body then you can't also store that as well so we've got some problems there as they say in the bank um, so for fertility, we need to be at an optimum level, I would say, um, between thyroid stimulating hormone and also all the other thyroid hormones. In fact, sometimes I think the TSH isn't necessarily the most effective um, measure of what's going on in your thyroid. It's kind of like the messenger hormone. So it's almost a kind of indication that things are out of balance, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go on thyroxine if things are a little bit on the higher side. So really really important to get your thyroid hormone balanced for fertility because it can if it's out of balance um, cause miscarriages and there is a lot of research on PubMed around um, thyroids being out of balance and um, causing issues with um, not maintaining pregnancies as well so we need to make sure that we've got everything balanced with the boiler system in the body get everything you know in the right um, levels in terms of those nutrients um, to make uh, make a healthy pregnancy because during the second trimester um, the innate uh, immune system can actually change quite radically and we need to make sure that you know that doesn't affect the um, the way that your uh, thyroid hormone is made um, and then again can cause some problems with women getting um, you know Hashimoto's for pregnancy um, and then after afterwards as well, because we are, you know, as women, when we get pregnant, there's so much, many nutrients that go into that. And the baby's always fine. It will pull those nutrients from wherever. But unfortunately, um, the mums can become very, very depleted. And again, when those depleted levels hit rock bottom, that's often when you get thyroid problems after you've given birth. And a lot of my clients, um, I'm very, very conscious of that um, and making sure we load up as much as we can on those cofactors, those important nutrients for the thyroid so that those are balanced um, and you don't have those kind of um, perfect storm situations for um, thyroid problems. And if TSH isn't enough to determine whether thyroid issues are a problem, 
what do you recommend that people request in terms of a full thyroid panel? What are the, the markers that are important to see? So I go kind of three tiers really for the thyroid. So the initial one is looking at thyroid stimulating hormone, T3, T4. Um, and if that one looks fairly okay, then, you know, I don't necessarily need to go any further. And we've got to look at the conversion between T3 and 4. I think there's a key conversion factor there, and it's important to look at that. If those are looking fairly normal, then I don't need to proceed and there is no issues. Um, but if there is, um, you know, a, a very low levels of um, T3, those are kind of the, the lower part of the range. And also your, your T4 is also in the lower part of the range or there's a big disparity between those two um, in terms of where it should be at optimal levels. I'll then look at the reverse T3 as well. Um, and that's kind of the store where everything's bagged if it's not necessarily working as well as it should, the thyroid. Um, so I'll do that. And then I'll also, as part of that, look at your thyroid antibodies. Um, so um, if those are out of balance, um, which it often can take, you know, up to eight years to actually get into that state. So you've probably consistently not been looking after your thyroid. You may, may have been living in a very stressful environment or working a very stressful job. And that, again, can put pressure on your thyroid as well, because the adrenals can take it because we're meant to survive, really, in terms of using our cortisol in stressful situations. But if we um, get to that point where you know the body's just so exhausted and we're in adrenal fatigue or our adrenals are kind of pumping out too much on a daily basis and it's getting too bad it passes that um, job down to the thyroid or passes some of the load and then that's when the thyroid actually starts to play up a little so it can take a long time to get to that level but if you are at Hashimoto's level which is the thyroid autoimmune condition um, then then we're, we're more in trouble in terms of balancing things um, because I've often had clients that have gone to the doctors and they put them on thyroxine. And again, all thyroxine is doing is just basically topping up your stored levels, really, your T4. Um, and I find that a lot of my clients, actually, they just have to keep increasing and increasing it because it doesn't improve how they're actually feeling. Some it can actually do a marvellous job with them, but... In some people, um, if we don't look at the rest of the body and inflammation maybe in the gut and things like that, then you know we've got we've got problems with just taking thyroxine. Um, it doesn't necessarily support um, the overall because what it's doing is giving that signal that you've got enough stored um, thyroxine there, and it doesn't necessarily um, help you with the fact that you're not making things and the cofactors aren't in there to support um, making that thyroid hormone in the first place. Yeah, it drives me insane when doctors maybe see a slightly elevated TSH or the thyroid's a little bit abnormal, but they just yeah. want to keep keep an eye on it. They'll monitor it and they're just mm -hmm. waiting for the thyroid to fully crash before they intervene with the medication. And yeah. I don't think that antibodies are regularly checked in the NHS. So it mm -hmm. would probably need to be something that's privately done or through an endocrinologist because in doctor's eyes, there's no real difference in treatment if it was Hashimoto's. Um, some of them aren't really educated on the differences between the autoimmune thyroid um, condition and just regular hypothyroidism. So could you just explain how, how Hashimoto's is different and maybe the treatment um, options that people have and how that differs from conventional hypothyroidism? So conventional hypothyroidism generally is just um, an issue with the conversion between the thyroid hormones T3 active to T4 stored So, and between those. So it kind of goes backwards and forwards. It's a bit like your current account and your bank account, really, and making sure you've got enough in there to balance things. So I, I haven't not seen any of my clients have an issue with that in terms of the conversion because... I think we're living very stressful lives and it can actually have a bearing on that. So most people's conversion can be okay, not brilliant. Um, but again, that gives me, um, you know, as a functional nutritionist, I'm looking at making sure that the best case scenario is there for them and it's not um, going, you know, down, down the tube basically. So with um, normal thyroid issues and hyperthyroidism or uh, hyperthyroidism, um, I need to make sure that the conversion is right between that. And again, like I said, 
when you've got those conditions, it can be suboptimal. And it is with most of my clients, actually, even with myself, you know, I've got to keep an eye on that all the time. And I think a lot of nutritional therapists generally do spend a lot of time working on their thyroid as well, um, because it's a big one to get right. It literally is like a, you know, a tuning fork to try and get everything as perfect as it can be really between that conversion. So I wouldn't worry too much if your T4 and your T3 are slightly suboptimal. What we need to do as nutritional therapists on that side is just put in the right cofactors and nutrients to support that and also try and bring down the stress levels as well. Um, as you said, the TSH um, is is one of those kind of raft of tests that generally people like doctors and endocrinologists will see and think, oh, there's problems there. We need to put you on some, some pyroxene. It's, you know, it, it's again a useful marker, but it's not the full picture. So when you've got all of those tests together and things are out of balance, that when you ha that's when I would deem things um, either a problem and we really need to work on that or suboptimal when, you know, there's, there's, there's slight tweaks we can do there. It's not got to the stage where the body has literally started attacking its own tissue. And that's what happens with Hashimoto's. Um, it becomes autoimmune and it starts to attack, um, you know, in that particular presentation with um, the, uh, the way the immune system is working, it's actually started to attack the thyroid gland as well. So, and that's when the TPO um, actually and the thyroid antibodies start to change and become much higher than they should be. So normally within normal ranges um, that you see at the doctors, it should be both before, uh, before below sorry 10 for TPO and I think for the antibodies it should be below 34. So if I see anything above that, I'm starting to think that the body is becoming more autoimmune and we need to work on that. And there is you know a range that you know things we can pull back from that. And I have had situations where we've worked on the gut and we've done some amazing work in terms of working on the bacterial load there if there's some issues. And that's really helped with Hashimoto's. And personally, I've never seen anyone with Hashimoto's that hadn't had a gut riddled full of issues. So I think, you know, if anybody's listening to this and thinks, oh, I've got Hashimoto's and I don't know where that's come from. My personal opinion is it's very much rooted in gut health. So um, I think it's always a good idea that, you know, we, if we see Hashimoto's in practice um, or we, we have that as, you know, as a person walking around, it's worth doing a, um, a stool analysis with someone like a nutritional therapist or a functional medicine specialist so they can actually root out what's happening there because, um, you know, it tells a story really. And I think that's, you know, the prequel, if you like, to um, the the film really if, if we've got Hashimoto's going down that route of you know really good gut health and supporting that and bringing it back into line again will really really help balance out um, some of those antibodies and stop the um, the body uh, looking at your own tissue and thinking it's foreign. I've seen that too like whether it's H. pylori, parasite, SIBO there's always mm. something going on in Hashimoto's because there's been studies to show that you, you need to have intestinal permeability, which is leaky gut, in order to develop mm -hmm. autoimmunity. So, yeah, always start in the gut whenever there's an autoimmune response going on in the body. And mm -hmm. onto clotting disorders. So this is less um, maybe investigated, less spoken about. When it comes to infertility, how do clotting disorders, how do they play into maybe recurring miscarriage or implantation issues? And how do we identify and kind of treat them as well? So, again, this is something that if you go through a genetic panel and have a look at your SNPs, you can find out quite um, an array, a, a, a total array of information. Um, when I use that information, I go through 23andMe or, you know, now I'm going through Ancestry.com or also I'm using things like um, Life Code GX for um the generic sort of information on that so if i use the raw data i can actually then plug that into an app and find out a little bit more about their clotting um disorders there or their their sort of past um down the family line if there's been a clotting disorder and i think a lot of that can be down to septicemia in past um past lives if you like so what happens with septicemia obviously that spreads around the body very, very quickly. And if you have um, something like a clotting disorder, that can actually stop that. So it's, it's very clever. It's a mechanism 
that will stop that happening um, in some instances. So if you have people with lots of clotting disorders, you can probably scratch the surface and find that they may have had ancestors in the past with, um, you know, that have had lots of um, diseases around, you know, you know, clotting themselves or getting some form of septicemia. Um, and again, that will be something that's passed down the family line there. Um, it's useful, obviously, you know, in medieval Britain and whatever, when you, you know, you're in battle and whatever, and you can get a, an infected wound and whatever, but not necessarily so good in modern Britain, really, or modern, you know, the modern world. Um, because if you have a clotting disorder, it can actually cause problems with um, clots in the placenta and actually, you know, then causing problems with getting oxygen to the baby. So, again, that can be something that I check. Um, and, you know, I, I will look into all areas, really, particularly around the genetic side. But you can actually get a regular test from the doctors if you have had multiple miscarriages um, where they look at um, some of those clotting genes. One in particular um, that they will look for are the factors. So factor five Leiden is, is a big clotting disorder that they will look into. Um, PAI, um, 5G and 5, uh, 4G also are, are important ones to look for. That's a new thing that we can look into, which I've seen coming up with some of my clients in probably the last five years. Um, and also some people say MTHFR is a clotting disorder, which I don't necessarily agree with, but it does have a bearing on you know cardiovascular health. So maybe that's where it came from with that. Um, so yeah, in, in the clotting panel that I have, um, when I'm looking into some of my genetic side of things, um, it will look at all of the factors. Um, and, you know, most people will have a heterozygous one as part of that overall panel. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will have, um, you know, problems with that. And I think sometimes we can get very kind of worried about, um, you know, having a clotting disorder. And, you know, if we see our genetics and thinking, oh, that's, that's terrible. But I think, you know, just looking at symptoms, really signs and symptoms, um, you know, can help with how your period health is really. Um, and also when you cut your finger, how long it takes to clot, um, you know, if it's very fast or very slow, that's an indication of what's happening in the body there. So if you do have, um, you know, are working with a, um, a hematologist or someone that can actually um, help you understand that a bit more, that's great. Often a lot of my clients will be put on um, some um, anti-clotting agents like um, Lovenox or Plexane during pregnancy. Um, and it basically helps to thin the blood a little so that, you know, there's no issues with multiple miscarriage. So again, diagnosis is key there. If you do have a situation where you've lost more than two to three pregnancies, um, either in the early stage or, or any side of the trimester, um, as throughout the pregnancy it's worth looking into maybe genetic side of things but also maybe getting referred um, to a specialist to see if they can test you for any clotting disorders. Yeah that's very interesting I had no idea about the the sepsis and how that mm -hmm. um, could play into the genetics that we have now but I feel like that's mm -hmm. the case even on the um, the PCOS episode that I had with Dr. Felice Ghosh that you said that you listened to, how she was explaining that women with PCOS, although we can struggle with symptoms in the modern lifestyle, we were the ones who maybe thrived thousands of years ago when there were famine or mm. um, when there was a lot of stress, we were like the warriors. So you can kind of think of that with a lot of genetics. And even though they can cause us problems now, we can think of them as like protective evolutionary um, changes that have been made. But when it comes to genetics, we sometimes hear about the fact that we can control whether the genes are on and off, that genetics aren't the destiny, that we have influence over them. How much of that is true? So say we have a genetic SNP like MTHFR, we'll come on to what that is, but are we able to have fully functioning enzymes in the MTHFR if we have a SNP or do we always have some sort of um lowered function with that once we have a genetic SNP in that enzyme? Well I would say people with MTHFR can live a very healthy life and I think this whole supplementing because you've got a gene is very dangerous. I've seen a lot of these gene companies now suggesting people go down a, a route of certain diets because of that. Um, you know you look at 
populations of the world, you know, in some of the, um, the information in PubMed, um, if you have any sort of South American, particularly Mexican blood and also um, Mediterranean blood as well, there's a very strong likelihood that you have got MTHFR more common than, for example, if you were from Northern Europe as well. Um, so, you know, we're talking about the fact that you have a genetic predisposition which gives you an advantage or disadvantage based on that particular time. So I would look at it always as, uh, you know, as that kind of situation. Um, it's there in your family genetics for a reason. And it could well be that that just makes you eat more folate. Or maybe it's happened because your, um, your family group generally eats a lot of folate and you don't necessarily need a fully functioning MTHFR gene there. Um, if you become a salad dodger, however, then you are in trouble. Um, so um, I think that's the problem that's happening with with modern world really is we are unaware of the fact that you know maybe these genetic disadvantages at the time were an advantage because you didn't necessarily need that for many generations people were eating you know a high folate diet and you didn't necessarily need to have you know a, a huge amount of folate because you were eating it regularly and it came up as that situation but I think you know, now we're not necessarily eating as much, um, it can be a problem because, um, you know, I liken it to dial-up internet as opposed to, um, you know, sort of 5G really internet. You know, if it's all working, it's very fast, the conversions are happening, you know, and everything's good. But if you've got dial-up internet, you still get the internet, but it just takes a lot longer to get there really. Um, and those things like the environment will trigger some of these genes into action. So they can be you know sleeping and dormant and there's no problem at all with it until for example you know your son or daughter goes off to university and they're having pot noodles for you know for, for dinner every night you know I've got a nephew that's doing it at the moment much to my horror he told me that he eats pot noodles all the time <laughs> um, and again that's when you, your health starts to suffer because folate is a very very important thing for DNA replication and I think you know regardless of the fact that you have you know you want to have a baby or you're listening into this because of the fact that you you know you're keen on improving your fertility you do need to have a lot of folate in your diet because you know cells die and they need replicating before they do so that we can actually repair and and improve things so it's a it's a key important factor and i think you know with the government mandating folic acid in lots of different countries including the uk now the the premise behind that is good but Folic acid generally needs lots of functioning enzymes to actually make it work. And we're not just talking about MTHFR there on the folate pathway. MTHFR is right at the bottom. It's your, almost your final destination, your slip road before you're coming off the motorway. Um, but you've got to get all the way from, you know, junction one all the way to junction 10, you know, on, you know, on the motorway before MTHFR makes, makes a play for things or, you know, can be a problem. We've got all these enzymes along the way, um, dihydrofolate reductase and some other things like that, which break down the folate. And if you're going in there with folic acid um, and you haven't got those enzymes or you've, you've got sort of um, uh, problems with, you know, heterozygous or even homozygous on some of those folate receptors, you've got problems. Um, so that whole folate pathway becomes, you know, a very, very difficult um, process. Um, and, you know, folic acid is something that I've been not using in my practice probably for about the last five years now. Um, I know it's very buzzy in the nutrition world and everyone's talking about it, but um, it's just something. Why would you put something in that's so cheap that, you know, generally you don't know what the population has in terms of how many other genetic um, mutations they may have on that side or SNPs that can't break it down? when you've got something that may be a little bit more expensive to produce, we've stabilised MTHFR now, 5-MTHF as a, a supplement. So, you know, it might be a little bit more expensive, but it's essentially the same family as, as folic acid, but it's just, you know, it's the, the Waitrose version as opposed to the Tesco's value version. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving all of these analogies. <laughs> yeah. Definitely helps people understand. And yeah, some people can be little bit put off by the price some of these like practitioner grade supplements but oftentimes you need to take less you don't need to take them for as long they're more effective and if you're not aware of your genetic makeup then 
rather than guessing and seeing if folic acid works, it could potentially have some negative effects. So why not just go straight in with folate, which we know works mm -hmm. for the majority of people anyway. And yeah. apart from the NTHFR genetic affecting fertility because of that folate connection, are there any other common genetic variants that can affect fertility that people should know about? Yeah, absolutely. I've got a kind of list here, really, that I can go through, Vivian. <laughs> Good. So one of my key areas that I look at, I don't just go to, you know, the, uh, the Mr. Popularity contest with MTHFR. I think people do get their knickers in a twist about MTHFR. There's so many other things that can also, um, you know, impact your fertility. For one, looking at your detox ability, you know, so that whole area of, of detox genes through phase one, through to phase two are very very important for me um making sure that we're looking at things that help break down estrogen um into its metabolites and then also from where the metabolites are passing that through to the next conduit that allows you then to methylate so things like um the cyp um 1a1 gene that's very important to make sure that that gives you bioavailable estrogen um, through breaking that down um, those enzymes break down um, estrogen you don't just kind of you know produce estrogen and wow woo, we've got it in our womb lining we actually have to break it down you know in a in a very sort of functional way um, with enzymes and then we get metabolites and obviously we need to pee out that excess as well and, and also you know get rid of it um, so cyp 1A1 is very important, um, checking that on the genetic side to see what we do with oestrogen. Um, if that is a heterozygous gene, or even if it's homozygous, that can mean that you have problems um, getting access to the, um, uh, the key important oestrogen, really, which is the 2OH oestrogen. Um, and also important to look at things like um, CYP1B1, which I see quite a lot, and that particular um, gene um actually um can help to through the process of um breaking it down um proliferate it really in terms of estrogen based cancers so um i've got that in my family actually and the last dutch test that i did which is a really really brilliant test and i'm sure you're going to be having dr carrie jones on to talk about that actually um gives you an indication of whether this is working effectively or whether it's not and i know for example that I've got two heterozygous, well, four heterozygous genes on the CYP1B1 um, SNP. And that, again, has made it more difficult for me to break down estrogen um, and has caused problems with um, my metabolism there in terms of 4-OH. So very, very key ones on the detox panel. Also looking at how you break down um, glutathione as well or, or your available glutathione. So things like um, GPX3, um, GST1, um, GSTP1, all of those are very important because particularly the GSTP1, if you have high blood pressure in the family or anything like that, that can predispose you to things like preeclampsia as well during pregnancy. Um, and also anything that breaks down or supports glutathione in the body, again, can be you know very important because what happens with um, some problems with um, uh pregnancy is it can mean that your digestion is a little bit um up the spout um and that can mean potentially that um bile becomes thicker um and the gpx3 actually can predispose you to things like gallbladder issues um which again links with another gene um pemt which again will help with choline and also it helps with fat metabolism as well so if you've got two of those genes in particular it can actually predispose you to more things like gallbladder issues and breaking down bile which again is how you get your nutrients if you've broken down in bile um, and how you know how you process through the digestive system so those key detox ones are the ones that i go to first um, which i'm really really keen to look at um, the clotting factors are very important because, again, if they've had multiple miscarriages, I look at that. Um, obviously, MTHFR is very important if you have compound MTHFR, which means you've got two heterozygous genes um, in the most popular SNPs, really, in those positions, the A1298 and the C677T. Um, that means that your gene is functioning um, at 50%, so it's much less 
but if you have a homozygous gene for C677T, which again can predispose you to cardiovascular events and high homocysteine and things like that, that's also important um, in terms of the genetic side of things. The other key thing that I would say as a gene that I always look for really, which is in this fabulous test, the Dutch test that I use a lot, is the, um, the COMT gene. So the COMP gene I call is the kind of um, air traffic control really. So it brings in um, neurotransmitters or it lets them stay up there too long and cause all sorts of problems. Um, it also brings in estrogen and allows you to break that down effectively. So it then moves your estrogen to phase two. So it's an important um, conduit, if you like, a, a key gene there that, uh, that does two things. It's got two hats there, supports neurotransmitters, um, and some key areas there, but it also helps you um, on the oestrogen metabolism. So if you haven't got issues further up with the detox, you may have a big blockage in the pipes really with, with um, the COMPT gene. And I think for women who are coming to me with fertility issues, who've got oestrogen issues in the family like fibroids or, or endometriosis um, or things like that generally and have high levels of oestrogen or cysts on recent tests, then I'm always interested in looking to see if COMPT is an issue there and then trying to put something in place that really helps that. So that's very basic around the, the genetics that I look for. There's a whole load of other things that are important like MTRR for the methionine cycle, um, things like PON1, which looks at how you actually break down pesticides in the body. Um, and also if you have um, you know, some detox genes that doesn't allow you to break down um, things like antigens really the HLA DR genes and, and mold and things like that and it can actually you know cause you more problems because it doesn't recognize um, a lot of those kind of problems in the body so it's looking at it in terms of an overall but always important I would say as a practitioner to put this alongside functional tests because you don't know if some of these things are expressing until people have got symptoms so never use a SNP as a basis for actually putting your whole program together because there's lots of people that are super healthy that have really rotten genes and they mitigate it by looking after themselves very well. So that's what I like about the Dutch test as well because it doesn't only give you an indication as to your genetics, it's definitely not a diagnostic in terms of that but it can help you see what's going on in terms of your methylation status, your um, comp function because I actually have uh, homozygous for COMPT as well so I need to be really careful about oestrogen and magnesium and B6 like save me <laughs> from having all of these like anxiety symptoms histamine symptoms but obviously everyone's different and needs to take that into consideration as well um, and how much control do you think we do have over the expression of our genetics? We have a whole lot of control over this. I think, you know, when we're a bit younger, it isn't really a major problem. But if you get sort of past 35, probably even sort of to 39, I think things start to really slow down. And that's when you really can't be partying like a rock star really all the time. You've got to take it easy. And I think, you know, as older women are coming to me to get pregnant and they're saying, I'm starting an IVF cycle next month. We just need a little bit more time really to work through some of these things because if they're starting to you know cause problems in the body and inflammation starting to start with that we need to just you know have a little bit more time to really go into that um, and work through some of those issues so it does have a, a huge factor on on things generally but i think you know if they are generally living in um, you know a, a very healthy environment um, stress is low and you know they're having regular holidays to kind of relax and they're looking after themselves with the right levels of exercise and they're also eating quite healthily as well um, some of these things don't start to trigger you know um, but again if they are coming to me for some support for fertility then potentially they are so we just need to look at what those basic um, genetics are and put that alongside a test and, and see where we can actually really delve into that and support, um, you know, both partners, really. And apart from the full thyroid panel that we've mentioned, the Dutch test has been um, helpful add on to that. 
Are there any other lab tests that you recommend most women get when they're trying to conceive? Um, males as well. Do Are there any different things that men should get checked out? Yeah, I mean, I go for very um, comprehensive blood tests to begin with, because although the Dutch test is brilliant, it doesn't look at things like FSH and LH. Um, it will look at estradiol, but it, um, trying to explain to clients that their estrogen blood values are different from um, the Dutch test is always something interesting um, because obviously we've got to explain that it's metabolized and it's actually what's coming out the other end what's been peed out really that's been utilized um, so I generally go for a very comprehensive test um, on the hormone side so I'll also look at um, LH, FSH, prolactin because I think that's very important because that can actually cause problems with fertility as well um, I look at um, testosterone because that, again, if it's out of balance, can cause problems. Um, and again, I'll look at DHEA and also sex hormone binding globulin because, again, for me, that's an interesting one to look at because we can see where everything's being um, pushed into the cupboard, if we say, really, for SHBG. If that's high, I often find that that's interesting in terms of inflammation. There's something going on there in terms of it preferentially binds to testosterone um, but it will also bind to estrogen as well so if you've got very high levels of that and everything else seems to be okay then that's kind of a bit of a red flag for me to look into something a bit more um, that there's inflammation or there's something um, that is you know kind of causing a problem with the signaling between the hypothalamus pituitary and the ovaries really um, and also the androgen side of things so I kind of put it in that group it's Part of it's not necessarily part of the androgen um, panel, but it does soak it up. It's kind of a sponge, I call it. it sponges all the kind of um, the excess hormones up. Um, and I think if it's if it's being utilised and it's high levels, then that's an important one to look at. Um, so the men can actually get exactly the same tests as the women. The only thing that um, I would say they don't get is progesterone testing. So all the things I've just mentioned there, we can also look into for male health. Um, I look also at if potentially they're a little bit tired or they have some symptoms of thyroid issues or if the thyroid is suboptimal, I will also look at gut health as well. So I start off with the first tier and then I kind of um, go d layer deeper. It's a bit like layers of the onion, really. Once you start peeling, you know, you need to get to the right ones. Um, and if there's some issues with thyroid health and they've had some bloating or some issues over the years or they've been to very unusual places on holiday, I'm right in there with a gut and stool analysis. Um, so those are very basic ones that I do. If I can do, I do the Dutch test because that gives me more indication of some of those neurotransmitters as well and how those are working and also some basic nutrients as well um, in their more active forms. Um, so yeah, those are the very basic ones. Then if there are some issues, we, we do delve a little bit deeper if um, they are suffering some um, from some other symptoms we look into. Um, mycotoxins tests if we can do um, you know it, it becomes a very expensive situation if people are coming to me and they've got lots of different symptoms um, if on the first glance the hormones are looking fairly decent then we don't need to go and spend a lot more money on that because it looks like everything seems to be working from um, that whole HPO and HPA access um, that's the good thing about the ducts as well we look into the adrenal health so everything else might be perfect but if their adrenals are out of whack then that can actually bulldoze a lot of the good work that you're doing because um, your stress levels can actually um, be the most important thing according to your body because it thinks you're in flight and fight so everything else goes to the wall really. Yeah, your hormones are definitely one of the they're like the followers aren't they they're not going to be balanced and healthy until your thyroid is until your gut is until inflammation levels are under control as well and i've definitely seen that with the sex hormone binding globular when that's high it's indicative of inflammation and stress where do you see what do you see being the cause of low levels do you see like pcos is a common one yeah but weirdly i've been seeing higher levels with people with pcos lean pcos lately so it's not following the um the usual route and I guess when it's high, if you have got PCOS, it's definitely an indication that um, there's inflammation happening somewhere, um, potentially um, gut parasites, SIBO and mould and things like that, really. So that's always one. 
that jumps out at me that I think we need to do further tests when we see a very, very elevated level of sex hormone binding globulin. Um, we go into that really. Yeah, and just lastly, touching on the subject of PCOS and endometriosis, because mm -hmm. these are two of the most common conditions that women have these days, um, especially mm -hmm. people who I'm working with. How mm -hmm. do these affect fertility, and what are your kind of treatment approaches to both of those conditions? So, with PCOS, um, again, just like um, Dr. Felice Gersh said, it's an evolutionary advantage. It basically meant that there was famine over a period of time that actually changed the genetics so you can see this in some of the genes um you know they, they jump out and even i've got some of these genes that relate to that and i can see that through my family line as well glycoma diabetes things like that really um so i think if you have this it can at any time start coming into play if you start eating badly and stressing yourself out and also not exercising so you may have a situation where you've been completely lean through your early teens and things like that and then suddenly you start to put weight on and you start to have those classic symptoms or you have you know really bad acne or you know sort of acne in the rest of the body and things like that so it's something that I think is really important to check always looking at your genetics to see if you're predisposed to some of these conditions um i.e you know the way your body manages insulin um and how it stores things so checking that is really important for me because you may not on the surface appear to be a typical polycystic ovary person or have some of those kind of list of things um but it's in your genetics so we don't want to obviously um you know start causing problems with that side so sometimes if i do see this and they've gone for um ivf and it's not been very successful or they've had anxiety and some issues like that i pop in you know, a high dose of inositol, which I find is a really, really good supplement. There's a lot of research behind it around the fact that, you know, probably at some point they wanted to try and patent it, which is probably why there's a lot of research around it. Um, so you you can't sort of go five five seconds in PubMed without looking at, you know, the importance of inositol in terms of it um, helping people with PCOS. So I would say one of the supplements that I use there, but in terms of the diet for PCOS, um, I'm not really a massive fan of ketogenic um, for PCOS um, because it can actually change the way your body works. Um, and then when you start eating semi-normal again, you know, the, the weight piles back on again. I do have a form of that, obviously, and it's looking at what works for you. And I do generally tend to go um, more lower carb. What I would say for people who have that predisposition they have a family history of PCOS or PCO is that probably being a vegetarian isn't the best idea for you because again that's going to be much higher in carbs um, and also it will predispose you to things potentially like copper toxicity as well which again can imbalance um, the way that your body works in terms of estrogen so there's lots of things really that um, we need to look at before people go vegetarian or if it is suited to them and it's around the genetics and also what their predispositions are really and if they have a family history of PCOS um, it's just all those kind of red flags that say not probably your diet and although it's an ethical question it's about you know how that actually makes your body perform really in terms of you know burning fuel and, and, and surviving really. so I'd say lower carb for somebody with PCOS or, or have you know that in the family um, and also making sure that you have a lot of phytonutrients in there really because you'll need a lot, a lot of antioxidants to support um, what's happening because um, we've got issues with you know how the body uses insulin um, and also I would say for a, a generic one really it's just um, you know working with the person um, you know I don't have a kind of one size fits all for PCOS because again like I said I had a lady who had you know very high sex hormone binding globulin so we wouldn't necessarily we treat and support the PCOS but also there was you know a kind of a red flag there in terms of inflammation in the body so you, you're constantly putting out fires really as a nutritional therapist in terms of what you need to be working on and what's the primary kind of objective really for for that particular moment um, and once you put out a few fires then you can start working on 
you know, business as usual, which is, you know, polycystic ovary syndrome or something that's stopping them getting pregnant, really, from that side. So it's about getting the cycle going to begin with. Um, and it could well be that, you know, it's not necessarily the PCOS that's the major problem at the moment. It may be that they have a lot of parasites or gut issues um, or bacterial problems there, which we need to sort. And that, again, can start the motor running once we get things going with the gut health. Um, and then if they have PCOS, it's, um, it's exacerbating their PCOS if things aren't working in the gut very well. Yeah, you know, it's a huge gut connection with the hormones in general. And mm. I've definitely, some clients feel like when we've addressed one thing, there's another thing pops up and we kind of, like you said, putting out fires, but it's because the body is so complex and mm. you can't expect your hormonal symptoms and your chronic illnesses to disappear within a couple of months if they've been developing mm. for maybe decades. Um, yeah. Cause the body is so kind of complex, like I said. So I want to finish up now because I know that you've got a lot to do today and I want to respect your time. I had a ton more questions. You know that I had questions on IVF, egg health, all of these things. So I would love to have you back on maybe to do a separate podcast episode, a part two, if you're happy to in a couple of months time. Um, and if there's any questions from today, I can kind of gather them up. I'm sure there will be and we can answer them in a second episode if that's fine with you. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Angela. And can we finish up by letting people know where they can find you online? And I know that you've just yesterday launched your Fertility Unlocked course. So sadly, we've missed the enrollment for this time. But are you going to be running that again? And what does that entail? Yeah, absolutely. So it was a bit of a hairy time yesterday trying to get everything sorted for that. But I've got a lovely group of ladies that are in there. Um, which we're going to get to know each other in the next four weeks. So it's, uh, I'm surprised I haven't done this sooner, actually, to be honest with you, Vivian. Um, but uh, I'm really, um, you know, head, ears and backside into the whole process now, which is great. Um, I'm hopefully going to be running it towards the end of the year. Um, I've got obviously um, August off, which I think is good. I think most nutritional therapists need a bit of a break because it's very intensive work working with people to help balance their hormones and get them pregnant. So um, there's going to be a little bit of time off for me to do a bit of research and change the way I work and move into different areas and develop certain things. But I will hopefully be running that towards um, the kind of uh, end of the year, really, um, for a new cohort of people. But um, in terms of where to find me, I have a website, um, Fertile Ground Nutrition. So just put that in www.fertileground-nutrition.com. Um, but I'm probably more active on Instagram than anything else, really. Um, I have a range of Facebook groups as well. Fertile Ground um, as one of them is a closed group. And then I have Fertile Ground Nutrition as my open group there. So if you have any questions on those groups, um, feel free to join them. Or, you know, if you wanted to, or if you're interested in the online program, then, um, you know, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll put you on the waiting list for the next one. Yeah definitely be a great opportunity for anyone who's trying con trying to conceive currently or even in the future they just want to prepare their body I think that's the best situation sadly it's not always the case for most women and when they want a baby they want one now so I think you'd be the perfect person to get help from and even this episode has been packed full of helpful information for women couples so yeah thank you so much Angela for your time and definitely everyone go over to Instagram and follow the fertility nutritionist because you're going to learn so much thanks Vivian I've had a great time thanks for asking me and it's been it's been a packed full episode which has been great thanks Angela